I know you're going to dig this. Ryan McLinn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. Zooming in all the way from Dallas, Georgia, is Gregory B. Johnson, keyboardist, auto sax, vocalist and was one of the original members of the funk group Cameo from 1973 to 1982. Welcome and thank hey. you for agreeing to come on our show. Hello, Gregory. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, this is so exciting. Um, you know, when, when, you know, you're listed in your category of when we look you up, you're, you're noted as a United States musician and pianist. And um, so we, as well as they list you as being a former member with Cameo. But I thought that was really interesting that they recognized you as a United States musician. Um, so that means that you got a lot of street credibility here when it comes to the music industry, Greg. So starting off, just before we get into all of your cameo life, how did you get interested in music in the beginning? Well, I started out very young, you know, thanks to my, my parents. My moms knew I had some kind of talent. She uh, had taken me to a dance studio and she she was just trying to find my mark where i fit in i didn't like the dance studio but the choir director at my church i was in the choir and uh, the choir director started giving me piano lessons i was about eight eight nine years old and uh, that's how it started he was a classical pianist and um i was learning classical music and he found out that I was playing by ear. He found out that once he played the song, I would be able to play it and I wouldn't be able to read the music. So that was how it, it eventually started. And listening to the radio, I remember hearing Ramsey Lewis, the in crowd, and that sparked me. So I took the record to him and said, this is what I wanted to play. And he said, well, this is not real music. This is, you know, looking back today, I realized that he didn't know anything about jazz or funk, you know? So he was just classical. But um, that's what started me. I started picking the records off, off of the radio, picking out the tunes, and uh, that started. So um, I decided to put a little group together, a couple of guys in the neighborhood. And uh, in our community center, we were in the Dighton Projects. They had a vast community center that catered to the young adults. And, um, you know, they had like a battle of the bands. So um, I had my little group there. What was the, name of, what was the name of your group? What was the name of your little group? Uh, we really didn't have a name, man. I think we called ourselves uh, the Royalistics, uh, some 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 crazy name, you know. And uh, so um, 
they had the other groups come in and Larry Blackman came in with his band and they were playing James Brown and all of this stuff. I disbanded my group and joined his group. So that's how it all started. And then we were called the Mighty G's. The Mighty G's. The like Mighty G's. And that eventually turned into um, the New York City Players. Okay. And um, well, before that, we had a group called East Coast. The, um, Gwen Guthrie was in that group. We played mainly at the circuits around Manhattan, you know, Long Island. Uh, they used to call it the Bucket of Blood circuit. So, you know, you play every year the same clubs. So we got the idea that we're never going to get anywhere if we just continue to play these clubs. So we decided to try and put some original songs together. And uh, we got a record deal on Encounter Records with East Coast. Didn't really go anywhere, but it was just the beginning. And after East Coast, uh, we uh, disbanded and put together the New York City Players. It's me, Larry Blackman, Tommy Jenkins, uh, a couple of other people. And we were touring in Toronto. And we had a little deal with uh, 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 um, a publishing company with this writer that wrote this song called Find My Way. Find My Way was um, the first single we ever had. And uh, uh, Neil Bogart with Casablanca Records loved this, this song. So uh, his partner, Cecil Holmes, they put together a record company called Chocolate City Records. And uh, Find My Way was released. It did okay, but it was our way of getting in the door to uh, get a record deal with the record company. So that's how it really all started. And um, up in Toronto, we had the, the deal and uh, Ohio players didn't want us to use New York City players. So we had to change the name. And, um, you know, at the time I was smoking Newport cigarettes and you couldn't get Newports up in Canada, but they had these, these uh, cigarettes called Cameo cigarettes. And, uh, you know, I was smoking a cigarette and I we said, well, we need to choose another name. And I said, well, how about Cameo? Put, held up the box of cigarettes. And um, that's how it really all started. Wow. Uh, that, uh, how long, now, what was your, uh, how long did you stay with uh, Cameo? I stayed until 1982. You know, I had did um, eight albums with them. Five of them went gold and one went platinum. And, you know, to me, rap music was coming in. I, computers were coming in. Uh, it was a whole different change that was going on. And I said, well, I need to ensure my future. And uh, I left Cameo to pursue other things, you know. Um, I left high school before I graduated to play music. And I had always promised my mother that I would go back and get my GED. And uh, that was one of the things on my list that I wanted to do. So in 1986, I got my GED. And from there, you know, I had this teacher that said, you know, you, you're a really smart guy. You really need to further your education. So um, I pursued uh, um, a music college and went to Manhattan School of Music. I did my bachelor's in jazz composition and my master's in uh, jazz piano. And uh, from there, I've been, uh, you know, teaching and um, doing other things. Um, after I graduated, it was still kind of difficult getting gigs. I wound up falling into a music store. And I remember going in the music store and I was asking the guy, okay, um, I want to do this. 
what do I need? And he sold me a Prada. And I get home and I realize that this is not going to work for me. So I go back to the music store and I say, well, you know, you sold me this thing here. How am I supposed to record with this? And the guy said, oh, well, you need this. You know, so I bought the next thing and the same thing happened. I get home and I'm like, well, wait, wait a second. You know, is this so in I New decided, York? Is all of this happening this, in this, New York? This, this all happened in New York. OK. You know, so I had to really get educated on the technology. So um, I went and signed up to uh, a music store, Sam Ash Music, in New York City. And uh, every day they would have trainers come in and train you on the technology. So I said, this is great. This is great. And from there, I wound up being that I had such a background in music. Um, I was a consultant for churches that needed to to get equipment. They needed to know what speakers to get for 150 people in a room or 500 people. And I became a, a consultant and um, uh, sold products, you know, while I was doing gigs on the side. So that's how it, it, it really started. And to, from there, uh, I went to another company, same thing, doing consulting, selling people audio gear for studios, people building their studios. And uh, I decided that, okay, I, I've done this for a while. I need to um, look towards the future. So I signed up to be a web content writer for audio products. Well, I was so wireless mics. I wrote the content you see on the website for all of these products. So it was all still related to music. And um, that's what I've been doing. You know, pretty, uh, pretty filled with uh, new projects. Let's talk a little bit about your cameo experience. And what were some of the highlights of playing with Cameo? Oh, there were a lot of highlights. Uh, I remember the first tour we did back in 74, we were the opening act with George Clinton and Paul and the Funkadelic. And uh, seeing that mothership come down from the ceiling, that was like really phenomenal. And then later on, we wound up doing uh, dates with Rick James. You know, we toured with... Uh, the Jacksons, you know, um, the Commodores, um, a lot of a lot of uh, acts, um, you know, the OJs. Those were the highlights. I mean, you know, and to top that off, when we bought Muhammad Ali's bus, there's a picture of us um, that was put in a Life magazine with us standing on top of the bus with our uh, all exposed and it's a great picture those were the highlights you know and um you know uh in 82 i decided it was time to move on and uh do something else you know um so that's what's uh you know one of the highlights with cameo so uh, are you still in touch with the the guys that are with cameo do you still have a good relationship or well, I talk with the guys um, formerly of Cameo. They, um, we talk just about every week, you know, and uh, we throw around ideas, you know, with this pandemic going on, there haven't been any gigs or any way to really work, you know. Um, so I retired from my consulting job last March. So I've been enjoying life you know, doing things, uh, you know, dealing with squirrels in the attic and landscaping and, you know, just enjoying life along with writing. And I still have a few students that I teach, um, you know, over the Internet. So uh, I've been enjoying life. So so uh, I can tell I can see the audience and I can both see and back of you. Those are. Uh gold records so what are they there are gold records um 
from Cameo. I did uh, eight albums with them. Five of them went gold for my third album, Ugly Ego. Um, we, uh, we, we all know who we are, uh, Alligator Woman, and uh, can't think of the other one. But uh, they went gold, 500,000 copies sold. And this was a time when there was no internet. You had to get out and you toured and you um, promoted the records, you know, through touring and through radio interviews, radio station interviews. And a I lot know, of hard work. I, you know, I noticed that in your um, credentials that you uh, got a writing credit that you received for uh, the platinum record uh, for for boys to men's album evolution. That's right. Uh, uh, what well, was there that? was a song. There was a song that I wrote with Cameo called "I Just Want to Be," and uh, that was sampled and used by uh, I think P Diddy or Puff Daddy, whatever you want to call them, was the producer. So that's what that platinum is from. And you did a solo uh, uh, album in what, 2012? Uh, I believe it was. I did two. I, 2012, and I did another one, I think maybe two years after that. Okay. Uh, the first one was called A New Hip. Um, and that relates to, you know, I had hip surgery. Okay. And, uh, before that, I was in a lot of pain. So after I got that, that surgery and had the hip replacement, it was like all a new hip. That was the name of that album because of how it, how it made me feel, you know? Um, and the second one was uh, uh, Funk for a Little Time, which was, uh, you know, a lot of people, the first album, my solo project was more jazz orientated. And a lot of people say, well, we want to get some more of the funk. So that's what the second solo release was. Uh, give me just a little more time, you know. So um, right now, you are, what are you doing right now? I mean, I know you can't be out on the road, but uh, what are your future plans um, with formerly, uh, what is that? F-O-C, formerly yeah, of formerly Cameo. Of Cameo. And yeah, who's, we plan on doing some things. We have some who's things in that, that group? I can't... Who's in that group, formerly of Cameo? You have Nathan Leftenant, Arnett Leftenant, Gerald Bright, Tommy Jenkins, and myself. Okay. So what's Larry Blackman doing now? You know, I really don't know. Um, we don't talk anymore. Since 82, I might have talked to him maybe two or three times. You know, we had a disagreement on a lot of incidentals, and uh, it's now being settled. But uh, we don't talk, and we were together since 73, um, you know, before Cameo. And, uh, you know, life changes people. Some people change, life changes people, you know, the attitudes change, people grow, and it's just a normal progression, you know? I'm very happy now, and that's, that's the main thing. Well, I, I was thinking that, could you play, play some music for us at this time? Would you mind? Uh, I can play a song from, uh, you know, just a little bit, because I really hadn't planned on it. But uh, this was from, um, this was called uh, um, Manhattan Isle. This was after 9-11. Um, okay. And on 9-11, all of the subways stopped in New York. There was no way. I lived about 150 blocks from where I was working at the time and so this was the um the the vibe of of the streets happening
It's just a little something. You know, I, I like that. Um, you know, the thing, here you are coming from a true funk of being with Cameo, studying classical music, getting your degree in jazz composition, um, it, and then to hear you play that, it, it was so soothing. It's so far away from the funk, but it shows what a talented, that's why I can understand why they would call you uh, a United States musician. And yeah. And I, I, I have a question to ask that um, during the time with uh, Ca Cameo later on was recognized, and I'm not sure, I think it was on BET where they got a Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, you were a part of that award, but you weren't with the band uh, uh, when they received it. Uh, are there any thoughts or feelings about that? Well, I mean, yeah, I wasn't contacted. A, a lot of the people that um, put in the work were not called to, you know, receive that award. I mean, you know, I have no animosity. I, I can't get caught up on something like that. Uh, that. That's a negative thing. You know, I'm always trying to move forward, you know, and um, uh, I don't really have any, any comments about that. Okay. I, I was just, I was just asking because it was rather noticeable. Um, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and but that's part of the, the, um, the separation, I think, with a lot of the members who are not there anymore. You know, um, recognition for the work done and, uh, you know, compensation for the work done. You know, I mean, this happens all the time with groups. You know, I hate to say sometimes it's a lot of black groups, but, you know, uh, I gotta move forward. You, you know, know, one like of the, you know, one of the things, Greg, was like when we, when we do, do a, when you do a reflection, when you do a reflection, uh, what are three of, uh, the learning experiences or takeaways that you had during that time that you were with Cameo? Well, Cameo was almost like a school. We, um, you have to understand that Larry and I, in the beginning, we believed that if you worked hard and did everything possible to be the best, you could have success. And that was what we did. You know, that alone was proof that you can be anything you want to be if you pursue it and do the right thing. You know, and Cameo was a school of that type of thought, of that type of camaraderie with all of the members um, who were in the group at that time. You know, they, we, we lived and we breathed that healthy body, healthy spirit. We all exercise, you know, um, and we all practice. You know, one of the basic requirements was that you got to know how to play two instruments, you know? So we, we pursued that with vigor and it just showed me that you can be anything you want to be if you just move forward and pursue it and believe in yourself and do the work, you know, do the work, practice, do the work. You know, a lot of the, the talent today, it's all computers. You don't have to really play an instrument anymore. It's, uh, you know, and uh, people want success instantly. You know, it doesn't work that way. At least it didn't for us. You know, we work for that success. Um, we were rehearsing in hotel rooms, doing steps like we were on stage and we were on the bus doing steps for the show. That's how, how, you know, um, serious we were about that. So it's, uh, you know, that was my greatest experience with Cameo is knowing that you can achieve if you put the work in. And I I'm thankful for that. That's, uh. You know, that's something they don't teach you in school. That's a great takeaway. I mean, that, yeah. that, that's, that's carried you to where you are today. 
Absolutely. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, Wayne Cooper. Um, and what was your relationship with Wayne? Wayne and I were close. We, Wayne and I, we got along fine. You know, we understood each other. Wayne could be um, a little um, outrageous at times, but, you know, we, we, we related. You know, Wayne was one of the, the, the best uh, tenors that uh, I've ever heard. You know, we had uh, auditions. We were looking for vocalists in New York City at uh, a rehearsal studio called The Daily Planet. And we must have saw about a hundred people. And um, we passed on all of them. Wayne came in, he was, I think, towards the end, the last person. And as soon as we heard him, we said, he's it. He is, he is, he is the one. And, and Wayne brought a lot to Cameo, you know, his vocal expertise, you know, his harmonies. Um, yeah, Wayne, Wayne was great. Wayne, Wayne was a good piece to the cameo puzzle. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, when, when, we, when we think about that, that's so, um, you know, there's certain people that come in our lives that even when they're gone, they still stay. And, and it appears to me that Wayne Cooper was one of those kind of folks. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but that's interesting you mentioned that because I think that's with all people you run into in life. You know, somebody's going to bring something to your life that, uh, you know, is going to benefit you or teach you. And that's the way it was with Wayne. Wayne was, uh, yeah, we, we think about him often. Well, what, what was uh, your favorite song that, uh, Wayne, that Wayne sang? Uh, Why Have I Lost You is... Um, Mm. is one but you know all the songs Wayne were on uh, I Just Want to Be that he wrote the vocal you know he does a riff towards you know the, the middle of that song which is the high point that just like it just makes the song you know uh, uh, all of the songs he was on he was uh, you know a very prominent voice what, what are your three favorite songs uh, from Cameo well, I know you. I know you have to like all of them because you play them yeah, all. But you still yeah, always it, have it a really favorite. Uh, the one I really like is uh, uh, "Your Love Takes Me Out," because what we were doing musically was uh, really unique. You know, my role was to make a whole bunch of those squeaky noises on, on the synthesizer, and that was like the high point. You know. Um, but it's a lot of, it's a lot, we have, there's a lot of songs. Um, I Just Want to Be, um, Your Love Takes Me Out, Why Have I Lost You, um, Freaky Dancing. Um, it's just so many of them. You know, even Rigor Mortis. I like Rigor That was our first big hit. You know, that was the, the single after Find My Way, which was to get us in the door. So uh, it, it's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of songs. You know, Greg, when, when you when we review um, where you were, where you are, and wh where do, where do you see yourself musically as the future once the um, pandemic lifts? Lifts. Where, where where do you see your future going with with in your music industry? Well, right now. I'm in the woodshed. And what that means is I've uh, working on my alto sax. I'm woodshedding, practicing to develop it better at, to the same degree as my piano skills. You know, um, I'm getting older. I don't want to be carrying around a whole bunch of equipment, you know, so alto sax is perfect. You know, I can carry that around and play that. So my, my, my um, outlook is to be able to do gigs and uh, help arrange music for uh, groups or individuals and, uh, you know, continue to teach. To you, 
What does funk mean to you? When, if someone asked you to define, say, Greg, what's your definition of funk? What would it be? Funk is a feeling, you know? Um, it's, a, it's a feeling that, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, we didn't have computers. So when you played something funky, you had to play it for the full length of the record. And that's what made funk the fact that you had to play it. You could never play it perfect, but when you put the feeling in it, you know, that's what funk is. And why do you think that we should have a funk music hall of fame? Well, funk is definitely um, a, a idiom, a, uh, a category that is the basis for all of the music you listen to today. I mean, it's the history, you know, it goes back. And without funk music, you wouldn't have the rap music you have today. Absolutely. So yeah, funk, funk should, be, should, should, should be a hall of fame. And there are, there are some groups today that, uh, um, you know, you could put them in that same vein, you know, um, Bruno Mars, you know, Prince was another one, you know, his stuff was funky, you know, but uh, yeah, you know, um, that category needs to be uh, notated because it will be lost if, if not. It, it Greg, I want to thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today and share your story about the importance of the funk and what you're doing and your and your life with Cameo Plus. And it, it is just so rewarding to be able to have your story shared with us today. This is Ryan McGlynn host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until next time, keep it Thank funky. Thank you so much. Keep it funky. Keep it funky. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Greg. It was, uh, it was my pleasure. It was so Oh, 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 oh,